Part 1. The Dangers Facing the Evangelical Church Chapter 1. At the Brink of Apostasy Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses, and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. 2 Timothy 3, verses 5-7 through seven. The evangelical church in America is facing some serious hazards that threaten to bring it to the brink of apostasy. My prayer is that it is not too late for an awakening that will lead to successful reformation. My use of the term evangelical includes all churches that are fundamental, full gospel, holiness, Anabaptist, and Pentecostal, all evangelical churches that believe the Bible and proclaim Jesus Christ to be the only Savior of the world. I have nothing to say to any other church. It is amazing to me how divided is the evangelical church in America, which reminds me of my mother's old-fashioned apple pie. No matter how thin you slice the pie, every slice believes it is better than the rest of the pie. Even though the pie includes the same ingredients, goes through the same process, and bakes in the same oven, each piece feels superior to the other piece. A stanza of the hymn Onward Christian Soldiers by Sabine Baring Gould, 1834-1924, says it as it ought to be. Like a mighty army moves the church of God, Brothers, we are treading where the saints have trod. We are not divided, all one body we, one in hope and doctrine, one in charity. The meaning of the words in this hymn is where God would have us stand as His church in this generation. Let me go out on a limb a little bit and prophesy. I see the time coming when all the holy men whose eyes have been opened by the Holy Spirit will desert worldly evangelicalism one by one. The house will be left desolate, and there will not be a man of God, a man in whom the Holy Spirit dwells, left among them. The Curse of Worldliness I hear Jesus saying, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Matthew 23, verse 37. As the church stands now, the man who sees this condition of worldly evangelicalism is written off as being somewhat fanatical. But the day is coming when the house will be left desolate, and there will not be a man of God left among them. I would like to live long enough to watch this develop and see how things turn out. I would like to live to see the time when the men and women of God, wholly separated and spiritually enlightened, walk out of the evangelical church and form a group of their own, when they get off the sinking ship and let her go down in the brackish waters of worldliness and form a new ark to ride out the storm. The Bible has no compromise whatsoever with the world. The Bible has a message for the evangelical church, calling it back home. The Bible always sends us out into the world, but never to compromise with the world and never to walk in the way of the world, but only to save as many as we can. That is the one direction. So, my Christian friend, if you are settling back, snuggling into your foam rubber chair and resting in your faith in John 3.16 and the fact that you have accepted Jesus Christ, you had better watch yourself. Take heed, lest you also be found wanting. Take heed of your own heart, lest when all is said and done, you have become tied in with the world. In looking back over the history of Israel in the Old Testament, I cannot help but note that just about every third generation had to throw out all the previous generation's religious accoutrements and get back to the original. It started with the fathers who established their nation upon the clear word of the Lord. The sons of the fathers began taking that foundation for granted, adding non-essential elements while allowing crucial and fundamental essentials to slide. In the grandsons, we find a complete disregard for the grandfathers who established Israel, completely disenfranchising the entire nation of Israel from its foundation and completely disregarding the prophet's warning, Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Proverbs 22, verse 28. 
They sought other gods that suited their fancy at the time. They looked with envy at the nations around them and began adopting the pagan gods of their neighbors. Soon, they also adopted the culture of the nations around them, and it was difficult to tell the difference between an Israelite and a Philistine. Then came the next generation, weary of the religious claptrap accumulated over the generations. They looked around for something original. Invariably, they would stumble upon the word of the Lord, and in a desperate move, they would clear away all of the religious paraphernalia that had been a part of the previous generation. That which was once mighty and dynamic was returned to with a great deal of anticipation by the younger generation. Today we would call it an awakening or a revival. A true revival or awakening leads to drastic reformation. It is often the younger generation that sees through the maze of deception and corruption and longs for something original, something with substance. Not only was this true of ancient Israel, but it is also true of the church. Church history reveals this pattern in almost every generation. When there was a move of God among a group of people, they became so plagued with holy desire that movements, we call them revivals or awakenings, began sweeping men and women into the kingdom of God. I could point to the Waldensians, who sparked a movement in the Middle Ages, Martin Luther and the Great Reformation Movement of the 1500s, John and Charles Wesley in the 1700s. Out of their fiery passion for God came a great movement known as the Methodists, which saved England from a national disaster. These great movements were not only owned by God, but were surely started by God, who found hearts hungry for something only God could provide. It would be hard to fathom how many people were actually brought into the kingdom of God through these movements aflame with holy passion for God. The pattern started with the fathers of the church. The sons then came along and tried to keep the movement going, tried to keep the flame burning, and make sure they were replicating everything their fathers did. It only lasted a generation, and then the following generation came along and found themselves burdened with religious bric-a-brac that had absolutely no association with their spiritual roots. Why do we do this? Why don't we do that? Soon the grandsons were allowing the world around them to bleed into their fellowship, and before long there was no visible difference between the church and the world. The culture of the world had effectively taken over the church. Sure, the grandsons looked like their grandfathers. Some of them even spoke in the religious dialect of their grandfathers. For all practical purposes, they were the grandsons carrying on the work of the grandfathers. However, they were not their grandfathers. That which was vital to the grandfathers became incidental to the grandsons. Instead of their religion carrying them forward in holy passion, they were trying to carry their religion and the weight of it brought them to points of weariness and religious fatigue and final collapse. They sought relief out in the world in the form of compromise. To negotiate with the world is to forfeit the sense of God's presence. I would estimate that no denomination has ever survived its 100th anniversary without a drastic overhaul from the inside out. The Apostle Paul warns about having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. 2 Timothy 3, verse 5. He adds with an air of finality, From such, turn away. When a generation comes along dissatisfied with the status quo and has a hunger for God that cannot be quenched by ritual and tradition, most of these do not come out of the religious hierarchy, but come stomping in unceremoniously with such a passion for God that they upset everything they come in contact with and bypass religious protocol much to the affront of the religious Pharisees and scribes in control at the time. The religious leaders condemn them and try to put them out of the church. However, they are the church, and they inflame a new generation with a holy passion for the person of God that cannot be quenched. This is where the evangelical church of our generation is. We are facing such jeopardy, and for the most part, nobody is enumerating those dangers. I want to share a little bit of my insight into this, and perhaps my meager efforts can stir up within the hearts of a new generation a longing and passion for that reality which only comes from an intimate and personal relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. As I look at the evangelical church today, I see several issues that need to be addressed. The first issue 
is the spirit of Babylon. The Haunting Spirit of Babylon I believe the spirit of Babylon is invading the church today to the point of controlling it. Anyone who has read the Old Testament understands the significance of the term Babylon. If you do not know much about this, let me point out the characteristics associated with the spirit of Babylon. The Spirit of Entertainment This spirit of Babylon, in the form of entertainment, has not only seeped into the church, but has also been welcomed to the front door with inviting arms and has come in like a flood. It seems so incongruent to me that a generation of Christians should so loathe the accomplishments of their forefathers and the sacrifice associated with the faith once delivered that they would court the frivolous attitude and spirit of entertainmentism. We are not worshiping God on the throne, but have come to the point of worshiping the shadow of the throne. The average Christian today is addicted to exterior pleasures. Can any Christian church survive today without a heavy dose of entertainment? It is the culture of fun, fun, and more fun. Performance has replaced worship. We no longer have worshipers, but rather observers and spectators who sit in awe of the performance. The demand is for something that will make us feel good about ourselves and make us forget all about our troubles. The church fathers were fanatic worshipers, and their worship carried with it a heavy cost, which, incidentally, they gladly and eagerly paid. The grandsons are now observers, with an appetite for entertainment that has gone wild. They are addicted with an insatiable appetite to have one thrill followed by an even bigger thrill. They are as fanatic about entertainment as their fathers were about worship, which explains the difference. To confuse the matter and make it even worse, we have now what I shall call a performance-oriented worship. Just because you tack the word worship onto a phrase does not mean that it is worship acceptable to God. We dance before God, wearing our silly little costumes and doing our silly little jingles, thinking that this in some way impresses the God Almighty, Creator of the heavens and the earth. The church fathers came into the presence of God with a sense of overwhelming reverence, which captivated them and brought them before God in holy silence. What has happened to reverence today? Where are those who get caught up in the spirit of reverence before their God? Where are those who have experienced the holy hush in the presence of God? Then we have celebrities who are leading our so-called worship today. This mirrors the culture around us. To be a leader in the church, a man does not have to have spiritual qualifications as much as a personality and a celebrity status. The converted football player wields more influence in churches today than the man who is before God on his knees with a broken heart for his community. Celebrities are now leading us, but they are not leading us down the same pathway the fathers of the church established. The Spirit of Lethargy All of this has successfully created in today's evangelical church a condition of spiritual lethargy. Because the word lethargy is not in common use, I probably need to outline a little bit of what I mean. By lethargy, I mean living on yesterday's momentum. That seems to explain the condition today. The church fathers did not look back and try to live in the past. The church fathers looked back to find their compass so they could go forward in the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. If we do not know where we have been, how in the world are we going to determine where we are going? That is the only reason for looking back. We do not look back in order to go back. Rather, we look back so that we can make sure we are going forward in the right direction. The Spirit of Ease Too many in the church today are living on yesterday's momentum. They feel that all of the battles have been fought. They assume that all the struggles in the church are over. They are the privileged generation that goes on to heaven on flowery beds of ease. Probably the most discouraging aspect of this is that many have grown accustomed to a static condition and have succumbed to a spirit of non-expectation. The only expectation most have is that when they die, they fully expect to go to heaven. Apart from that, they are going to spend their time having fun and enjoying their religion. The church fathers did not enjoy their religion. 
Fox's Book of Martyrs shows what their religion cost them. They did not expect an easy time of it. It was Charles Wesley, 1707 through 1788, in his marvelous hymn, Soldiers of Christ Arise, that set the tone for his generation. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on, strong in the strength which God supplies through his eternal Son. Strong in the Lord of hosts and in that mighty power, who in the strength of Jesus trusts is more than a conqueror. Where are these soldiers of Christ today? Where are those who go forth in the strength which God supplies? Where are those who are willing to go forth conquering and to conquer? The tragedy of this generation of Christians is that men have crept in unawares, as prophesied by Paul in the book of Romans and by Jude in his epistle. We have lowered our guard, and these false prophets have so positioned themselves that they are controlling the destiny of this generation's Christian church.